Excellencias, distinguished Excellencies, distinguished representatives, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to welcome you all to the Counterterrorism Committee's open briefing on integrating gender into the work of the committee and CTED. I am particularly pleased to see the participation of women's civil society groups in today's discussions. The aim of today's open briefing is not only to take stock of where we are, but also to identify ways in which we can more meaningfully incorporate gender perspectives into our work to counter terrorism and violent extremism. It has been four years since the Security Council adopted Resolution 2242, calling for greater integration of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda and the Counterterrorism Agenda, and requesting the CTC and CTED to integrate gender as a cross-cutting issue throughout future activities. While challenges remain, we have seen important progress in the implementation of this resolution. In that regard, at the end of 2017, the language of Resolution 2242 was explicitly incorporated into CTED's mandate renewal in its Resolution 2395, and I welcome CTED's subsequent appointment of a dedicated gender ad advisor. The Security Council has also addressed the importance of gender perspectives in the fight against terrorism in several thematic resolutions, including addressing the links between transnational organized crime, human trafficking, and sexual violence in conflict, as well as in our collective responses to the phenomenon of foreign terrorist fighters. Resolution 2396 on returning and relocating foreign terrorist fighters recognizes the many different roles that women play, which require special focus when developing tailored prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration strategies, as well as gender and age-sensitive responses when women may have been victims. The Committee's Addendum to the Guiding Principles on Foreign Terrorist Fighters provides further guidance on this issue. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, meaningful, meaningfully integrating gender considerations into counterterrorism, a complex and multifaceted task. However, it is a necessity, not only from a rights-based perspective, but also from an operational perspective. The fact that the committee is holding today's briefing in the margins of the Council's annual open debate on women, peace and security shows the continued determination to strengthen the integration of the two agendas. The open debate provided a timely opportunity to reflect on the achievements and challenges in implementing Resolution 1325 and subsequent resolutions, as well as on the future direction of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda in the lead-up to its 20th anniversary next year. We believe today's presentations and exchanges will contribute to those discussions and continue providing an opportunity to reflect on lessons learned in our efforts to integrate gender as a cross-cutting issue, particularly in counter-terrorism efforts and in order to find ways to make further progress in this area. I look forward to our discussions. Thank you. I would now like to give the floor to Ms. Concili Mamba Buko, Executive Director of UN Women. Excellencies, Excellencies, I want to start uh, by thanking and appreciating uh, the work that is done by both the CTED and CTC on the work uh, of countering terrorism and for the active role they are taking in ensuring that resolutions 2242 of 2015 and 2395 of 2017 with the provisions of, on gender integration in all processes and mechanisms of counterterrorism and cooperation is actually being uh, uh, followed, followed through. Thank you uh, to member states who are here 
Thank you to civil society for the excellent work they also do. There is definitely a link between gender inequality and terrorism. The challenge posed by violent extremism and terrorism is growing in both scope and complexity. Gender is a vital component of this. UN Women and Monash University recently released research on the correlation between violent extremism that could lead to terrorism and misogyny. It found that hostile sexist attitudes toward women and support for violence against women are the factors most strongly associated with the support for violent extremism in all of the four countries that were measured. Today, as we grapple with the dynamic political situation and the unfolding crisis in camps of persons affiliated with terrorist groups in Iraq and northern Syria, with the majority of its population made of young women and women, it is critical for us to take deliberate actions to increase gender responsiveness in related processes. This is because gender-blind policies and systems in terrorism-affected contexts might increase the risk of a strategic failure. UN Women supports integrating and mainstreaming gender at all levels and across all processes and mechanisms related to UN counterterrorism efforts in line with the Security Resolution 2242 and in support of implementing Security Council Resolution 2395 and 2396. Strengthening gender analysis and recommendations when conducting in-country assessment missions is also important, and this is the work that we, we also do in cooperation with CITED. As well as, to date, UN Women has supported more than 10 counter country assessment missions, and our experts joined CITED delegations in some, in some assessments. We also work with CITED to conduct targeted local research exploring the gender dimensions of terrorism. UN Women avails its platform in HQ and at the regional level in support of CITED and the CTC. For example, CITED co-hosts together with UN Women's regional experts discussion series on gender and prevention on violent extremism in the Middle East and North Africa. In addition, UN Women chairs the Gender Working Group of the UN Counterterrorism Global Compact, where we implement joint advocacy and capacity building projects in partnership with CITED, UNODC, and UNOCT. Within our mandate, UN Women works closely with national governments and regional entities, including the AU, G5 Sahel, and the Lake Child Basin Commission, to increase gender mainstreaming in counterterrorism frameworks and processes. And I have had the, I can't say the pleasure, but I have had the, the privilege of visiting Lake Chad, Afghanistan, of course the Middle East, North Africa, and see to some extent the work that we are able to do together in those locations. Through our regional offices in Dakar, Kenya, Cairo, and Bangkok, UN Women continues to support consultations on counterterrorism responses with civil society and the integration of their input onto the global processes. We continue to ensure that this work actively supports governments and the UN system to fulfill their counterterrorism commitments. Our work this year identified several priority issues, and these include the systematic and structural biases against women that continue to be exploited by terrorist groups to advance their agenda in mobilizing and in subjugating women for their sustenance. Young women are desired, and girls for that matter, are desired as targets for terrorist group to recruit as suicide bombers and fighters. This is gender parity in terrorist rhetoric. A gender parity that is not delivered by state gets abused by terrorists who then use women in the most devastating way to women's lives. In that sense, we are being outmaneuvered by terrorist groups in using gender parity and gender equality in the context of terrorism. This demand of us to, res to reflect on how we think about peace, security, and gender. Accountability and justice for victims of terrorism also needs to be prioritized. Crimes of sexual and gender-based violence 
committed in the context of terrorism must be criminalized and prosecuted in line with Security Resolution 2467 of 2019 on SGBV in conflict and post-conflict. The provision of humanitarian assistance is critical, especially as we know that women and girls suffer disproportionately in this context. Access to life-saving measures need to be granted in a timely manner. The challenge of broad and vague counterterrorism leads to shrinking civic space, and that too must be addressed. This challenge threatens to undo decades of hard-gained rights. We must exert all possible efforts to protect and promote women's civic and political rights. Commitment to mainstream gender in counterterrorism must be implemented, for example, in prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration process. When rehabilitation and reintegration programs operate under the assumption that women are less dangerous than men, then it is inevitable that it features serious gaps. We must budget adequately to increase women in law enforcement and judicial personnel and in counterterrorism decision-making processes. More also needs to be done to understand the drivers of violence and extremism that could lead to terrorism and the interlinkages with gender dynamics. This also is important in the context of rise of hate speech. In closing, uh, 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 as, as we approach the 20th anniversary of the Security Council 1325 and scale up on our Generation Equality Campaign, which will mark Beijing 25, I look forward to increased partnership with member states as well as civil society to address these issues towards our common objectives in 2020 and beyond. And I thank you. I thank you, SG Mlambam Kuka, for her statement. We will now hear a video message from ASG Michelle Conanx, Executive Director of the Counterterrorism Committee Executive Directorate. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, since the adoption of Security Council Resolution 2242 in 2014, there has been growing awareness of the need to integrate the agendas of women, peace and security and counterterrorism, and to include gender considerations in our counterterrorism and CVE efforts. The Security Council has mandated CTAT to integrate gender as a cross-cutting issue throughout its activities, including within its country assessments and reports, recommendations made to member states, the facilitation of delivery of technical assistance and briefings to the Council. The integration of gender into our counterterrorism responses has real policy implications in many areas. As we have seen, one such area is the return, rehabilitation and reintegration of women, women associated with ISIL. Security Council Resolution 2396, adopted in 2017, recognizes the many different roles that women associated with foreign terrorist fighters may have played. It also recognizes that women require a special focus when member states develop tailored prosecution, rehabilitation and reintegration strategies. Further guidance on this issue is provided in the Counterterrorism Committee's addendum to the Guiding Principles on Foreign Terrorist Fighters of 2018. Much of our attention has, of course, focused on the large number of women who joined ISIL, but the challenges are not limited to that context. They also arise in the context of other terrorist groups, as well as in the context of our efforts to address the diverse roles of women as victims, as supporters, and as perpetrators of terrorism, and as agents of change in preventing and countering terrorism. There remains an urgent need to better understand the drivers of female radicalization, the different roles women play in relation to terrorism and violent extremism, and the differential impact of counterterrorism strategies on women's human rights. We must also continue our work to ensure that women's potential as agents of change in preventing and countering terrorism is fully recognized. CTAT is committed to executing its mandate in a gender-sensitive way in accordance with the relevant Security Council resolutions and to support the leadership and participation of women and women's organization 
in counterterrorism and CVE efforts across the globe. We have integrated gender into our assessment of member states' counterterrorism responses. Many of our assessment visits on behalf of the committee benefit from dedicated gender expertise provided either by our own gender expert or to the participation of UN women, with which we have developed a strong partnership. CTAT is committed to enhancing its efforts to integrate gender into its assessments and dialogue with member states and to increase the number of recommendations to member states regarding gender-sensitive counterterrorism and CVE policies. As you are aware, CTAT is a lead United Nations entity tasked with analyzing trends and emerging issues in the area of counterterrorism. Recently published a trends report on the gender dimensions of the response to returning foreign terrorist fighters, as well an analytical brief on the repatriation of ISIL associated women. CTAT will further strengthen its work in this area by gathering and disseminating gender sensitive research and by organizing research focus events with the participation of gender experts and academics. We have also strengthened our engagement with women's civil society organizations, both here in New York and elsewhere. For example, we cooperate with UN Women on the regional platform on gender and countering and preventing violent extremism in North Africa, which provides a forum for the exchange of insights and good practices among gender experts from the states of the region. CTAT will continue to enhance its engagement with civil society, including women's organizations, with a view to assessing the impact of counterterrorism strategies on women and their rights, and to collecting good practices in this area. And I'm pleased to note that we have several civil society representatives as speakers at today's briefing. Last but certainly not least, we are committed to do our part to help ensure that gender is mainstreamed throughout of all UN counterterrorism and CVE activities as vice chair of the Global Compact Working Group on Gender together with UN Women. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, today's open briefing marks another step forward in our efforts to show how gender perspectives can be better integrated into our collective counterterrorism efforts and how they can help make those efforts more tailored and more human rights compliant and thus more effective. I do thank you and I wish you all a fruitful discussion. I thank ASG Konangs for her statement. I believe that we will now have the opportunity to discuss many of the issues and topics highlighted by the USG Mlambo Nkuka and ASG Konangs. I would like to pause for a few minutes to allow USG Mlambo Nkuka to leave the room and proceed to her next appointments. We will now continue with three sessions followed by an open discussion. But before we proceed to our first session, I would like to draw your attention to a few important housekeeping matters. We have a full agenda today, and so I would like to kindly ask all participants to limit their interventions to mo no more than 10 minutes. Thank you for your cooperation. As this event is being broadcast live, and CTED will also be live tweeting throughout uh, the afternoon, you are all welcome to share this in social media. We will now move to the first session on drivers of female radicalization. I would like to invite panelists of the first session to come to the podium. <coughs> 
Es para mí un placer y... It is a pleasure for me to open today's first session and to welcome our first presenter, Ms. Alexandra Dia, Gender Coordinator of CTED. I now give the floor to Ms. Dia. Thank you, Chair, um, and good afternoon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. In my remarks today, I want to briefly set the scene for our discussion on drivers of female radicalization and highlight why a better and more nuanced understanding of these drivers is essential for our collective counterterrorism efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, women aren't simply jihadi brides. Women join terrorist groups for a variety of reasons. They play different roles in different and they exhibit varying levels of regret or remorse if and when they leave such groups. Research on gender drivers of radicalization has evolved. Initial approaches tended to portray women as passive, easily manipulated, and emotionally driven. But empirical evidence has since shown that such interpretations of female motivations are problematic for a number of reasons. Such emphasis on the personal plays to stereotypes and depoliticizes female violence. This not only denies women agency, it fails to acknowledge and address their perceived grievances, making them ever more vulnerable to radicalization and potential recruitment. It also leads to dangerous gaps and blind spots in the, t in the security response. Research has shown that the factors driving women's radicalization can be political, socioeconomic, and psychological, just as they are in the case of men. These factors play out differently in different local contexts, and they are likely to vary between foreign recruits and local supporters of a group. Much more research is needed on different local contexts, and it is essential to hear the voices of local women on these issues. Some recent studies have sought to unpack gender dynamics in different contexts showing that human rights violations and harmful gender norms within society and communities are central to the radicalization of both men and women. And crucially, we know that terrorist groups can be extremely skillful at exploiting these gender dynamics. Studies have shown, for example, that violent extremists often draw on concepts of violent masculinity to provide a perceived outlet for the sense of disempowerment and resentment felt by some men. More gender analysis, including concepts of masculinity and femininity, is therefore needed to inform our understanding of both male and female susceptibility to violent extremist ideas. Without understanding the diverse circumstances and motivations behind women's radicalization, it's not possible to design adequate measures to counter or prevent their involvement in violent extremism. While understanding gendered drivers is essential, the roles played by women within violent extremist groups need to be understood as well. The Security Council has recognized that women play a whole spectrum of roles as violent perpetrators, recruiters and fundraisers, ideologues, as spouses and mothers, and as victims. What is important is that these different roles are not mutually exclusive. In other words, we have to be mindful of the fact that the categories of perpetrator and victim are not binary, and that women can be both simultaneously. In some situations, women who are victims because they were coerced or trafficked become supporters, either to better their situation, through personal relationships, or due to indoctrination to radical ideas. The reverse can also be true. For example, women who willingly traveled to support ISIL then found themselves in situations that they did not anticipate and where they themselves become subject to the many types of violations that ISIL committed against women. These are complex realities, and we therefore need a nuanced understanding of the different roles that women play and their different experiences within violent extremist groups. Such an understanding is essential to ensure adequate support for victims, as well as to accurately assess the risk posed by women upon their return to be able to properly investigate and prosecute them where, them where appropriate, and to offer them tailored rehabilitation and reintegration programs. It is essential also for prevention strategies and for the design of measures, including counter-narratives, to counter terrorist groups' active and deliberate exploitation of gender vulnerabilities. 
Taking into account the gender dimension of terrorism is therefore not just an academic exercise, and it's not just about ticking the box of political correctness. It has real and tangible policy implications. The case of ISIL should serve as a powerful wake-up call that has shown us that gender dimensions cannot just be an afterthought in our counterterrorism efforts. As we go forward, it is essential that we include gender analysis from the outset when looking at new trends and developments in the terrorism landscape. This includes looking at gender drivers in new hotspots and at-risk regions. It includes also considering the gender dimensions of new rising forms of terrorism. The Security Council has given CETA the explicit mandate to conduct gender-sensitive research and collect data on the drivers of radicalization for women and on the impacts of counterterrorism strategies on women's human rights and women's organizations. CETA's trends reports report on the gender dimensions of the response to returning foreign terrorist fighters and our recent analytical brief on the repatriation of ISIL-associated women are two examples of our work in this area. CEDAT is committed to further strengthening its analytical work on gender, including for our ongoing dialogue with member states, and by reinforcing our partnership with the research community and our outreach to women's civil society organizations. I thank you for your attention. I thank Ms. Chair for her presentation. I would now like to welcome Ms. Leanne Erdberg, Director of Countering Violent Extremism of the United States Institute of Peace, USIP. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. I will begin by expressing my gratitude to the Chair and to the members of the Counterterrorism Committee and CTED for the opportunity to participate in this open briefing on integrating gender into your work. I'm honored to participate together with colleagues from CTED and Interpeace. The Counterterrorism Committee's attention to issues of terrorism and violent extremism and how, it, how to integrate gender is crucial. I'm encouraged by the work of the Security Council, the Secretary General and Secretariat, UN Women, several other UN agencies and member states in furthering international coordination to advance issues of gender and preventing violent extremism. My name is Leanne Erdberg and I am the Director of Countering Violent Extremism at the U.S. Institute of Peace, although the views expressed here are my own. USIP was established by the U.S. Congress 35 years ago as an independent, nonpartisan institution to prevent and resolve violent conflicts abroad. The rise and expansion of violent extremism continues to pose a significant threat to global peace and security and understanding violent extremism and how to address it as a top USIP priority. In my remarks today on the drivers of female radicalization, I will cover two main topics. One, what terrorist groups understand that international policy still misses, and two, how we improve our efforts in this regard. What terrorists understand? The road to violent extremism is neither simple nor predictable. The journey to extremism includes diverse motivations and many individual paths. No profile accurately describes all who join. This makes preventing and countering violent extremism exceptionally difficult. Millions of people may experience the similar situations and live in context with the same structural drivers but never join. And some people will join who we would have never deemed at risk. But like many social challenges, progress is possible when we embrace complexity and try and parse out trends. And the gender dynamics of radicalization is one of them. As interim director of the Resolve Network, a consortium of researchers and research organizations on violent extremism, I have seen an incredible growth in academic literature on female radicalization, many of which has been referred to by my colleague from CTED, that is illuminating new developments and practical empirical findings. From ISIS to far-right extremists, research has examined the gender-sensitive ways that terrorists recruit. They cater propaganda specifically to men and women differently. They define the gendered needs and rites of passage into adulthood, and they even use gendered humor to justify their vicious ways. Though most terrorists would hardly consider this an accolade, many of today's violent extremist groups unintentionally are gender experts. <laughs> 
I recently saw a video interview of a 26-year-old Belgian woman who was living in a Syrian displacement camp, and she detailed why she left for Syria, the horrors of marriage to ISIS fighter, and wartime struggles. But when asked about when she joined, she said that they promised her a better life, a better place to raise her children, a society where her mere existence would contribute to fighting injustice. Her path is significantly different than that from a former white supremacist who spoke at USIP this past August and who now works to help others disengage from violent extremism using empathy and compassion. In her story, rage from past trauma and the prospect of being part of a group, a substitute for a family, motivated her to join. While their pathways were distinct, both the stories highlight how violent extremists promised to fill gaps in women's lives, gaps that they deeply care about. From neo-Nazi groups to the FARC to Boko Haram to ISIS, they have been able to offer women roles that are traditionally male-dominated, including as combatants, as recruiters, as managers, as financiers. They offer, also offer them roles as wives, as mothers, and a crucial part of the community and a crucial part of the cause. They make them believe they matter. However, women who join these groups are often subjected to extreme parts of gendered violence enduring rape, various forms of abuse, and human trafficking. Violent extremist groups thus are adept at recruiting women using idealism and hope and belonging despite their practice of brutal violence, subjugation, exclusion, and aggression. This, they appeal to a women's sense of agency and cater to a very personal level, sometimes spending hundreds of hours with the susceptible, making them believe that they are seen, that they are heard, that they are loved. So what does this tell us that can enable future progress? After years in working to address violent extremism, I've come to understand how incredibly opportunistic violent extremist groups can be. Whatever it is your need, from a physical safety to the need for love and belonging, they promise that they can provide it for you. Their playbook is inherently adaptive. They demonstrate success over time and amongst people from all walks of life. So to address the recruitment of women, the international community needs to be more adaptive. First, go local. To address gendered recruitment, international efforts can delegate more flexibility to local actors to design and shape their activities. Terrorists use gender implicitly and explicitly to recruit men and women differently. These differences, differences are often dictated by social and cultural context, as well as gender, as well as age, and they will necessarily result in disparate needs from a prevention effort. The need for flexibility is precisely why at USIP we're proud to work with Kenya's Sisters Without Borders, which empowers local women-led organizations to define what they know about violent extremism in their own communities and help them communicate that back to national level policymakers. The second is to highlight hypocrisy. Like many criminal enterprises, terrorists promise far more than they deliver. Disillusionment is constantly cited as a reason for leaving. For instance, terrorists promise agency to female recruits, along with a strong sense of identity, uh, perception of power, and social status. But what they're really offering is power over others, often over other women, over youth and other marginalized groups, and women only operate within the parameters of what others, namely men, have defined for them. Real agency and self-determination is consistently denied within groups that mainly use violence and fear to rule over members and non-members alike. Identity and social status are warped into cult-like norms, proving it hard to leave, and for most women, taking away all notions of individual choice. We can instead do more to deliver on the real hopes and aspirations that terrorists provide, uh, promise to women but fail to provide. At USIP, we are researching the psychosocial aspects of nonviolent resistance movements and what that might provide individuals compared to those that are provided by violent extremist organizations. When crafting initiatives to stem women's recruitment into violent extremism, we can learn from nonviolent resistance and other avenues that actually provide women opportunities for belonging and recourse rather than false promises. In conclusion, too often when it comes to gender and violent extremism, a simplistic trope dominates the conversation. Women are defined as preventers, as victims, and at times as hardened, irredeemable threats. <laughs>
it is much harder to see women as complex with many intersecting roles and identities, many beliefs and wants. It is even more difficult to develop policies that are not just gender sensitive, but gender savvy. To address this complex phenomenon, we must use what we know about the intersecting identities of women and how they are targeted by violent extremist groups. We must also provide those at the local level the flexibility they need to define their own initiatives and activities. And we must deliver on the very real human wants and human needs the terrorist groups promise and ultimately fail to provide. Thank you. I thank Ms. Eldberg for her presentation. I would like to welcome our next panelist, Mr. Graham Simpson. You have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, thank you for this opportunity uh, to see Ted um, in particular. Um, for me, it's a great opportunity to um, reflect a little bit on the voices of young people in these, in these processes. And so I speak with um, some experience from as the lead author of, on the progress study on youth peace and security and hope that I can bring the voice of young people and the perspectives uh, that they shared through 281 focus groups in 44 countries, seven regional consultations, over 40 country-specific and thematic studies, and a survey of youth-led peace-building organizations, all as part of the mandate which my study had to explore the positive contribution of young people to building peace and preventing violent conflict. The starting point for them, in many respects, would be a concern about the very language of radicalization itself. In some ways, young people expect as change agents to always be a little uh, rebellious. And the grave danger is that this often means that the spaces they occupy in their peaceful protest and dissent are easily treated as threatening. This is particularly true for young women for whom sometimes just participation in political processes or participation in the education system is often seen as a signifier of some form of mischief. There is a grave problem of mistrust that young people have in their governments, in the multilateral system, and this lay at the heart of our study. It is hard to hear, but we need to recognize that very often, young people, because of the treatment that they receive, often feel more frightened of their governments than they do of terrorist or extremist organizations. This is partly because young people are often stereotyped and experience this. These stereotypes are highly gendered. The conversation about youth peace and security inevitably conjures up, first and foremost, images of a young man with a gun and young women often consigned to the status of passive victimhood. And yet in our attempts to reclaim the agency of young women, we also need to be very careful that we don't simply talk about their agency as their participation in terrorist groups or in security forces, because what this may often do is result in us securitizing the, uh, the gender conversation rather than engendering our counterterrorism conversation. The grave danger that young people f find is that they are treated primarily as a threat rather than in terms of their agency as peace builders and their positive contribution to building peace um, and preventing violent conflict. These stereotypes and this treatment of young people as a threat has produced three policy assumptions, what we call a policy panic um, in the progress study. On the one hand, the assumption that the youth bulge, growing populations of young people as a proportion of the population, presents an inherent threat of increased levels of violent conflict. And there are many examples that contradict this and very little evidence to support it. The second is the assumption that it is young people, and particularly young men, and I'll come back to this issue, um, who, are, who, who through patterns of um, informal migration present the threat of intrusion, infiltration, increased terrorism. And the third, and perhaps most relevant to this conversation, is the assumption very often that all young people are in danger of joining extremist armed groups. 
We've already heard today that it is in fact only a tiny sliver of young people who, who make this shift. And the majority of young people, whilst we ought not to romanticize them, they're certainly not all peace builders, very few of them are joining extremist armed groups. We need to do more to understand and invest in the spaces that young people occupy that is on the other side of this divide. The consequence of this policy panic is a massive investment in hard security approaches to young people. These approaches usually rely on a bit of a needle in the haystack approach, the impossible exercise of trying to predict and understand how individual action results from collective experience, which, which young people do join these groups and which don't. And I think our precision on understanding this, I think we've already heard, is somewhat flawed. Even more importantly, the assumptions we make about this are seldom tested. The consequence of our investment is seldom properly assessed. And the grave danger is that even worse, it is sometimes counterproductive. Perhaps the most important message that came from young people and that is captured by my study was that until we deal with their perspectives on the violence of their exclusion, and that is their language, until we deal with the violence of exclusion, we will never prevent the violence of extremism. And young people describe that exclusion in comprehensive ways. It is about their exclusion from political participation. And in every single one of these arenas, we will see that this has very particular relevance and particularly extreme manifestations for young women. Young women are particularly excluded from political participation. They are dramatically marginalized in their economic empowerment and participation in the economy. Young women are struggling to find place in educational institutions. They experience their lack of protection in human rights terms as particular and extreme. And so we need to recognize if we talk about mainstreaming or integrating the gender peace and security or the women peace and security agenda into the counterterrorism discourse, we need to recognize that the unique experience of young women in all of these arenas shapes the way we understand and the way they understand their exclusion. So what is the alternative? Young people described in extraordinary terms their involvement and participation in uh, positive contributions to building peace. This is the alternative investment path, in particular in the investment in the resilience and creativity and innovation as peace builders of young women. And I would argue this is the most important discourse that we need to follow if we are to effectively prevent violent extremism. For young women, this is about um, participation in, across different phases of conflict as peace builders. Young women are involved in all levels of conflict, from the family, from the most local in their institutions, to political participation in national and international networks. Young women are innovating in the networks they forge with human rights organizations, with youth organizations, peace building organizations, and they are found in women's organizations. They are particularly innovative in the arena of arts, media, sport, and the occupation of cyberspace in their innovation and thinking. And young women offer a unique platform, along with youth organizations, for rethinking the processes of reintegration of former fighters into communities where they are elder-led communities that often re-alienate or re-marginalize young people. Imagine what it would look like if it was youth organizations and women's organizations that were providing the new home. But we also need to recognize that resilience itself is gendered. When we spoke to young people, often young men asked, what makes your communities and societies resilient in the face of threats of violence and recruitment into terrorist organizations? They often said, it's the women in our communities who provide homes, who keep our children fed, who, who unite families. Yet if we asked young women what made their, their societies and communities resilient, they would often answer the same way. They would say, it is women and young women who do. Yet often they would talk about how in the context of conflict societies, conflict-affected societies, they find new places of belonging, new places and new roles in economic participation, 
in political roles because when their hus husbands go to war, very often young women acquire new forms of power. And so for young women, resilience was about stepping outside of the gender stereotypes, which often constrain them. Whereas often for young men, resilience was interpreted as young women's traditional roles. We need to listen to this more carefully, and we need to recognize it. In conclusion, we ought not to romanticize the role of young women as peace builders any more than we can afford to demonize them um, as threats or as a threat of violence. But what this does demand of us is seismic shifts in the way we think about strategy for resolving these problems. Most importantly, this means moving away from thinking about young people and young women in particular through the lens of the threat or risk they pose to thinking about how we can invest in their resilience and resourcefulness. And lastly, this demands that we move away from remedial approaches to preventive approaches that are genuinely seeking to invest in the upside. Thank you. Do you like it? I thank Mr. Simpson for his presentation, and I thank all of our panelists for their comments. We have reached the end of the first session. We will now move to the second session on gender-sensitive prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration, and I would like to warmly invite the panelists of this session to the podium. I would like to welcome Mr. David Wells, Political Affairs Officer of the Counter-Terrorism Executive Directorate. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to share some of CTED's insights into gender-sensitive PRR strategies. These come from our engagement with member states, including through our assessment missions, but also from our engagement with a wide variety of partners, including CTED's global research network. But before I do, I want to recall what the Council and its Counterterrorism Committee has said about gender in the context of PRR strategies. As we have already heard, the Council emphasized in Resolution 2396 that women associated with FDFs may have served in many different roles, including as supporters, facilitators, or perpetrators of terrorist acts. The resolution emphasizes, therefore, that women require special focus when developing tailored and comprehensive PRR strategies, including through the provision of assistance to women associated with FDFs who may be victims of terrorism. Last year, CTED supported the Counterterrorism Committee of the Security Council in their review of the Madrid Guiding Principles in light of the challenge posed by returning and relocating FDFs. And in the addendum to the Guiding Principles, which was adopted last December, the committee emphasized that member states' PRR strategies should take into account gender sensitivities and factors. I wanted to briefly look at the broader context of why gender sensitivity should be included within PRR strategies and provide some examples of how this is and isn't being done currently. Firstly, though, it's worth re-emphasizing what underpins today's discussion. Being gender sensitive means challenging assumptions about the role or roles played by an individual that are based on their gender. 
we have seen some positive examples of this in the context of member state PRR strategies. For example, there has been a clear evolution in the response of some states with an increasing recognition of the importance of assessing and investigating women returning from the conflict zones, and where appropriate, prosecuting them for any crimes they may have committed. Yet in other examples, states have continued to treat men and boys and women and girls as distinct and coherent groups, which in turn have informed gendered policy responses. This lack of gender sensitivity manifests itself in all aspects of the PRR process. States have particularly struggled with the prosecution of women associated with ISIL. In some regions, women have received maximum sentences, including the death penalty, for mere association with an ISIL fighter. In others, women who travel to join ISIL and share their propaganda online have received comparatively lenient sentences, often following legal arguments that emphasize their lack of agency as young women. The corresponding impact of this bias, of course, is that men and boys tend to receive harsher sentences based on assumptions about their agency, their role, and the threat that they may pose. If women are not effectively assessed, investigated, or subsequently monitored because of their gender, then it will be difficult for states to identify or adequately respond to any security threat that they may pose. And just as importantly, these assumptions may also mean that they do not receive the necessary rehabilitation and reintegration support, putting them potentially at greater risk of recidivism and making it more difficult for them to successfully reintegrate into society. There is also a limited understanding of the most effective way to rehabilitate and reintegrate women returning from conflict zones, whether in the context of ISIL in Iraq and Syria, or women associated with other groups, including Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab. Research indicates that a lack of socioeconomic opportunities can be a key driver in the radicalization in certain contexts. This suggests that offering these opportunities as part of a PRR program could be a key factor to successful reintegration, and yet in some states, these opportunities are more typically offered to men than women. And finally, studies have shown that women returning from terrorist groups are disproportionately at risk of stigmatization, particularly those women who have experienced sexual violence at the hands of terrorist groups. The stigmatization can undermine rehabilitation and reintegration efforts and potentially lead to re-radicalization and recidivism. The challenges I've briefly outlined clearly demonstrate the importance of further research into and guidance on designing and implementing gender-sensitive PRR strategies. CTED will continue to engage with member states and all of our partners to assess implementation and capacity gaps, identify good practices, and facilitate the provision of technical assistance where needed. Thank you for your time. I thank Mr. Wells for his presentation. I would now like to welcome our next presenter, Mr. Matteo Pasquale, Deputy Representative of the New York Office of UNODC. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Excellencies, uh, distinguished delegates, dear colleagues, uh, the remarks of the preceding speakers have, I believe, uh, evidenced the importance of considering how terrorism and counterterrorism efforts sorry, I lost the counterterrorism efforts and measures affect women and men differently, and how gender dimensions should be taken into account when preventing and responding to terrorism, including in the field of criminal justice. Our work in UNODC is based on the conviction that incorporating gender lens is essential to the effectiveness of the criminal justice response to terrorism and to ensuring respect for human rights, in particular women rights when counterterrorism. In my remarks, I intend to provide a brief introduction to UNODC's work in this area, particularly focusing on gender sensitive prosecution, rehabilitation and reintegration through technical assistance to member states and the development of tools and publications. There are at least the three ways in which applying a gender perspective is integral in prosecution efforts in terrorism cases. First, integrating gender perspectives into the use of investigative powers, interviewing and witness protection measures is key in ensuring that criminal justice authorities are effective and comply with fundamental human rights standards. It can also strengthen accountability for terrorism offenses, improve the relationship between these investigative authorities and the communities affected by terrorism, 
and assist in addressing the condition conducive to the spread of terrorism. Important ways to integrate gender perspectives in this regard include strengthening women's representation in law enforcement and the judicial systems, as well as trainings of techniques of gender sensitive investigations and prosecutions to both women and men working in these systems. Secondly, adopting a gender lens is particularly important in cases involving female alleged offenders in order to, one, dispel conventional gender stereotypes, Secondly, recognize the manifold roles that women play in terrorist groups, including acts of violence in operational roles and non-violent non-violent support roles, and understand the spectrum of agency through which women fulfill these roles, ranging from voluntarily through the coerced. Third, while it is, evident, is widely recognized that terrorist groups perpetuate sexual and gender-based violence for tactical, strategic, and ideological objectives, perpetrators continue to enjoy impunity for these crimes. In May 2019, UNODC presented its handbook on gender dimensions on criminal justice responses to terrorism, which is now available in six official languages. And the handbook provides guidance to assist policymakers and practitioners in mainstreaming gender through the criminal justice responses to terrorism, ranging from investigation to prosecution and adjudication, deprivation of liberty in the context of terrorism cases, accountability for SGBV, and victim support. As an example, the handbook provides a wealth of recommendations on gender-sensitive interviewing of suspects, witnesses, and victims, and on gender-sensitive witness protection measures. These are drawn from work done by member states and UN entities in other fields of justice, particularly the investigation and prosecution of trafficking persons, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Furthermore, the handbook seeks to provide legal and operational guidance to overcome challenges to accountability for SGB crimes perpetrated by terrorist groups, such as the stigma faced by victims and the omission of such crimes from the counterterrorism laws of most states. Third, the handbook provides uh, guidance in favor of uh, women and recruitment of women in law enforcement, counterterrorism agencies, and judicial system, and supporting their advancement while providing specific examples of concrete measures to overcome obstacles to the recruitment, promotion, and retention. UNODC supports member states to integrate the gender perspectives in prosecution efforts through its technical assistance programs. For example, in close collaboration with OSCHR and UN Women, and funded by the European Union, UNODC is training Nigerian investigators, prosecutors, lawyers, and women rights advocates on integrating gender perspectives in the investigation, prosecution, and adjudication of terrorism cases and deprivation of liberty, victim support, and accountability for SGBV. Together with Nigerian international experts, UNODC also developed a training module on these issues tailored to the Nigerian context to be launched in December this year. As a result of this technical assistance, one of Nigeria's main counterterrorism investigative agencies has set, has set up a, danger, a gender desk. They have reported to us a very specific example of how greater awareness about the roles of women played in Boko Haram has contributed to gather important evidence in a high profiling case. In Iraq, you know, this implements a project, generously funded by the UK, which aims to strengthen the capacity of women professionals working in the counterterrorism sector with a particular focus on policymakers and officials in the criminal justice and law enforcement systems through awareness raising and training activities. Turning now to rehabilitation and integration, women suspect accused and convicted of terrorism-related offenses or otherwise associated to terrorism groups, let me highlight two specific aspects of this issue. First, in most countries, prison-based intervention programs for violent extreme, extremist offenders are nearly exclusively tailored towards male prisoners. And there is a need to develop rehabilitation programs tailored to female violent extremist offenders and to share information about existing efforts by some member states in this regard. Second, women formerly associated with terrorist groups face gender-specific challenges when they seek to reintegrate within their communities. In many contexts, they may be confronted with greater stigma than men, even where communities recognize that many women were coerced, trafficked, or tricked into association with the group, or played a lesser role in terrorist violence. 
This is particularly the case of women with children born, often as a result of rape, during their association with the terrorist group. In conclusion, you know, this is handbook provides guidance to member states on developing gender sensitive rehabilitation and reintegration measures for both women and men. It provides examples of promising member states practice in this area and in related areas, such as the rich body of practice accumulated with regards to the reintegration of women associated with armed groups in post-conflict situations. I thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Mr. Pasquale, for your presentation. Now I would like to invite our last panelist of this session, Ms. Cordula Droga, Chief Legal Officer of the International Committee of the Red Cross, to take the floor. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Excellencies. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, Thank you to the Counterterrorism Committee for inviting the ICRC to join this important briefing. In my remarks today, I'll first address the distinct needs and risks of um, the women perceived to be affiliated with the, the Islamic State group in Iraq and Syria. And I'll also turn to where we go from here in efforts towards gender-sensitive prosecution, rehabilitation and reintegration. As a preliminary point, what I would like to say is that while a great deal of recent media attention has been directed towards the activities and fate of third country nationals, it's imperative to recall that the wider population, so Iraqi and Syrians beyond the media spotlight, also continues to face deeply complex humanitarian situation, and that must not be overlooked. Now, turning to the situation on the ground, the situation of women affiliated with IS is characterized by two things. The severity of their humanitarian needs and a marked diversity and complexity of individual cases. Now about the severity of the needs, this is exemplified of course in uh, northeast Syria. Um, the current situation in Al-Hol um, this is the biggest, but it's not the only camp. I visited uh, it in March this year. It's simply unsustainable. And it's not comparable to what the ICRC sees in other parts of the world. This camp now holds approximately 68,000 uh, people. 90% of these are women and children, with many, women, uh, with many children under five. And about one-third of those people are third-country nationals. Beyond Al-Hol, and this was mentioned also uh, before, women facing prosecution in Iraq uh, also require our attention. Regardless of the potential culpability under domestic or international law, they have a distinct set of needs and they face specific physical and psychological risks. Their distinct needs include such things as female hygiene items and medical care for pregnant women, nursing mothers, and for those who've experienced sexual violence. The specific risks they face include retributive violence for being uh, IS, so-called IS brides, but also statelessness of their children arising from nationalities, laws, and policies which do not um, confer the right on women to pass on nationality. Um, and also prosecutions that fail to take into account the broad range of roles of women in the context, and I'll come back again to the variety of, of roles. Many of these women are mothers. Uh, some are very young, underaged mothers who were taken to Syria or Iraq uh, by their parents as children. The prolongation of this uncertain situation can only exacerbate those needs and risks. Given current developments on the ground, the ICRC is urging all parties to the conflict, irrespective of the time period during which they control specific areas, and of course this varies, to guarantee the security within uh, and around the camps and places of detention and to ensure the safety of persons present within them. The situation of women, as I said, is also characterized by the diversity and complexity of individual cases. It's something that's been mentioned also uh, quite a few times now. So what I'd like to emphasize is that we must exercise caution um, and avoid oversimplification of women in this context. 
Women may have traveled voluntarily to areas where armed groups were active, or they may be victims of trafficking. They may be both perpetrators and victims of war crimes, including but not only sexual violence. They may have fulfilled a wide variety of roles as members, civilian affiliates, exclusively family members. And this diversity is not new, of course, and Security Council Resolution 2496 of 2017 acknowledges that there's a need to distinguish between those involved in terrorism and their accompanying family members, and recognizes that women in this context may also be victims of acts of terrorism. So this is not a, an anonymous mass of people. They have roles that must be assessed on an individual basis. So this brings me to the question where we go from here with regard to gender-sensitive prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration. To answer this question, we must first remember that the international community has developed a wealth of guidance and good practice to which we can turn. In short, we have the necessary tools. Um, the Bangkok Rules for the Treatment of Women Prisoners, the Secretary General's UN Key Principles for the Protection, pa Repatriation, Prosecution, Rehabilitation and Reintegration of Women and Children, the UNODC Handbook uh, just mentioned on Gender Dimensions in Criminal Justice Responses, the 2018 Madrid Guidelines, the recently released UNOCT Handbook on Children Affected by the Foreign Fighter Phenomenon. So together, these provide thorough guidance as to how gender-sensitive prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration can be conducted. And at the ICRC, we've also seen some good example of integration of policies and policies when people are returned from Iraq and Syria context. So for instance, mental health and psychosocial services that states have uh, provided. Um, and this can also include individual follow-up as well as group or family members to support the return, community engagement, and these are very important aspects of, of reintegration. Maintaining the family unit is also an important aspect when possible, and sometimes where um, in certain countries repatriated mothers have in some cases been placed under house arrest or received suspended sentences until children reach a predetermined age. But despite this wealth of guidance and instances of good practice, the primary challenge, and I come back to what I said before, to gender-sensitive prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration in this specific context is the absence of a case-by-case -case individualized screening. The dehumanized language used to describe these women and the low rates of repatriation for third country nationals in Iraq and Syria the situation in the camps remains unsolved, and this is the immediate challenge. It's for this reason that the ICRC is encouraging as a matter of priority that each case be reviewed by competent authorities on an individual basis. Specifically with regard to third country nationals, our view is that women and their children currently in northeast Syria should be repatriated with due respect for the principle of non-refoulement, of course. Pending repatriation, we urge states to use their influence to ensure that their nationals are detained in adequate conditions, that they have access to basic services, and that they are transferred in accordance with international law, given the acute humanitarian situation in the camps. We also emphasize that successful reintegration starts early, meaning that preparation for repatriation should not only be dealt with by security services, other services such as social services and child protection services need to be involved. Preparation is needed with the families and the communities. And it's also critical that these services take account of the specific trauma that some of these women have experienced. So this can include extreme violence, of course. Sometimes it's the experience of becoming a mother when you were still a child yourself. Very often, and I, I saw this also when I was in Al Hol, the loss of their own children. Many of these women have lost children. Um, and possible sexual violence, of course. So the ICRC stands ready to support, to the best of its abilities, states' efforts in this matter. We particularly encourage states to refer to the available guidance, just mentioned and, and mentioned so eloquently also before, to work together to exchange also good examples of you know, what can be done 
So for instance, exchanges on the possibility of individualized screening, on the success of reintegration programs when they have been successful, on positive experiences of how to repatriate people. There's no, there will not be any easy solutions to this issue. A colleague of mine said there will not be any painful solutions. But there are humane solutions. Humane solutions do exist when there is a political will. And ultimately, it is a matter of political will. Thank you. I thank Ms. Droga for her presentation, and I thank all of the panelists for their presentations. This brings us to the end of our second session. We now move to our third session on the role of women's civil society organizations in countering terrorism and violent extremism. I would like to invite the panelists of this third session to the podium. I would like to welcome our first panelists for this, this session, Ms. Fionnuala Ni Orlin, Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms While Countering Terrorism, who is joining us via VTC. Are we connected? We will change the order of statements. I would like to welcome Ms. Yasmin Ahmed, Rights Watch. Oh, I, I apologize. Let me now give the floor to Fionola Olin. Señora Fionola. Ms. Olin. Bueno, creo que vamos a hacer un... I believe that we will then change the order of presentations. I will now give the floor to Ms. Yasmin Ahmed, Rights Watch UK. You have the floor. Thank you very much. And it's a, a big job to be going for the North. Ladies Sorry. and gentlemen, can we hear you? Can there you hear are. us? She heard me. Lo siento, señora Ahmed. I apologize, uh, Ms. Ahmed. Uh, Ms. Olin, we can hear you now. La estábamos escuchando. 
Lo siento por tercera vez. I apologize for the third time. Starting and then if, if we hear from Fanula, then I am no problem at all. I will stop and we can hear from her because, okay. yeah, just to make sure that that happens. Well, first of all, I wanted to thank CTED and Hi. the Counterterrorism can Committee. Can you hear me? <laughs> we can hear you. Yes. Señora Fionala, ¿nos escucha? We can hear you now. Señora Fionala. Miss Fionola. <laughs> Señora Fionola, la estamos escuchando. Fionola, we can hear you. You have the floor. I will just keep going. <laughs> and when Por we favor, hear from sí. Manila, um, let's do that. So thank you very much to CTED and to the CTC and to the member states who are here today, as well as all of those that are in the audience. We're here to talk about a really, really important issue. I myself are from a civil society organisation called Rights Watch UK. And we work on gender and counterterrorism as one of our main issues, and we also integrate it into all our areas of work. And before I speak about my organisation and I go into some of the findings that we've made about in this area, I wanted to talk a little bit about myself. So I am the executive director of Rights Watch UK, and we're an organisation that is based in London, and we work to promote just, accountable, and sustainable security. Prior taking up, to taking up this position, I was a legal advisor at the UK Foreign Office, and before that, I worked for the Australian Government. I've also worked for the UN. So you could say that I've had quite a range of experience in terms of and where I am today. Um, but today I want to talk to you about some really important work that we have been doing. For the last two years, Rights Watch, along with other organisations and clinics, including Duke's University's Human Rights Clinic, have been looking and mapping the gender impact of counter-terrorism and countering violent extremism measures, both in the United Kingdom and in a number of countries in Western Europe. And what I wanted to do today was talk to you about some of the findings that we have made in, this, in our research, and hopefully our report should be coming out early next year. But before I do talk to you about my findings, I, want, I think it's really important for all of us to sit back and think about why, in fact, is it important that we take account of gender when we are thinking about counter-terrorism and countering violent extremism. Why is gender and why are human rights important? So the first is that strategies are only effective, as we all know, if they have the buy-in and they are working in cooperation with impacted communities. And that includes within those communities women. So it's absolutely important that we reflect on and we review our policies to ensure they are human rights compliant and to ensure that we are, in fact, working hand in hand with communities. Because if they are not human rights compliant, that will not be happening. And that, for states, is the biggest issue, is that if they're not human rights compliant, they're not effective strategies. Also, one of the acknowledged factors conducive to driving persons to commit acts of terrorist violence are state policies and practices, in particular those that discriminate against or undermine the rights of their communities and those who are associated with it. And women are obviously a large part of those communities. So again, from the perspective of efficacy of our security policies, we must be taking account of gender and the human rights impact. And I think we also must, one of the things that has come through very clearly for our research, that whilst taking account of the experience of women and human rights is essential, we must do so in a way that we are not co-opting rights and we are not co-opting women 
into a security or securitized agenda. And that is absolutely key. And I will say that for a couple of reasons. First of all, we all here have to have a commitment to gender equality as an end in itself, not as a means to an end. It shouldn't necessarily or be linked to security. Also, when we securitise gender, we take away the agency of women in their own communities and make them the battleground upon which the fight against terrorism is played. We, by securitising rights, women's rights, we place women, and this is what we've heard again and again, in an incredibly difficult position because they, are, they feel loyalty to their own community, but at the same time they want to speak about issues that are organic and happening within their community. And by securitising it, we and states are making that very difficult for them. And one thing that's very, very close to my heart, as a Muslim and as a feminist, is that you hijack the authentic and organic voice of Muslim women those that are organic and talking about women's empowerment. And there are women not just in the West. In fact, these movements of Islamic feminism originated in the Maghreb in the Middle East and they've influenced people like myself to today. And we must be looking at and seeing these organic voices and not overshadowing them or co-opting them. Also, we shouldn't be taking and we shouldn't be promoting any gender essentializations. As has been said by speakers before, women are not just victims and they are not just perpetrators. They are a multiplicity of things in between and on both spectrums. And in order to deal with violent extremism, with terrorism and with per persons who may be driven to those matters, we need to deal with the complexity of how women engage in these issues. And finally, we should not be placing responsibility on the shoulders of women in Muslim communities to be doing the job of de-radicalisation or to be, uh, to be finding signs of, of, of radicalisation. That is not their job and their responsibility. And in doing so, you're placing a burden on them a burden that they already have to hold in so many other regards. So many of the women we spoke to said Islamophobia is gendered. Our experience of the security state is gendered. Where does that leave us? Please take account of us when you are formulating and reviewing your terrorism policies to how that will impact us. Now, I want to speak very briefly about five ways, and I'll be very brief, that, I, that we have found that gender has, that counterterrorism measures impact gender. The first is the direct targeting of women under counterterrorism and CVE policies. And what we have found is that there have been an increase in a number of the states we were looking at, there's been an increased number of women who have been charged, prosecuted and sentenced for terrorism acts. But the majority of those acts that they have been prosecuted for and sentenced for are incohate offences. So offences around assisting and aiding. Now, we know in a number of member states that, that uh, offences around assisting these sort of ancillary offences are growing in nature. Definitions are becoming more and more broad and less is actually tied to the nature of violence itself. And what that inherently means, there's a huge de gender implication for that because it means it captures more people around the individual that is in fact committing the act of terrorism. And what we have found again and again, that has captured family members, including women. Now, certainly in some of those circumstances, those women will be directly involved in the terrorist act and they will and should be prosecuted for that. But what we have found is that the crimes themselves, the way that they are uh, laid out and developed and also the way that they are charged and sentenced doesn't take account of the circumstances of women, the vulnerability, the marginalisation, the position that they hold within the family. None of those circumstances are taken into account. And that is incredibly important because we're looking at circumstances where women, there's an intersectionality of experiences that they come to these situations with. They may, are already marginalised. They may already be in a situation of vulnerability. And we are adding to that without taking adequate reflection of it.
Secondly, I would talk about the collateral consequences for women of CT policies directed at, female, at male family members. So here we have seen, we've heard on many occasions through our research, the impact, for example, of administrative measures that are taken up by the state, which are pre-crime measures, which have, as we know, a, a less safeguards than we have in, in criminal measures, where it has a direct impact on the family. So, for example, if a man, the main breadwinner, is subject to house arrest or is subject to certain conditions or is, is, is unable to take up employment, it has a direct social and economic impact on families. We've heard of women who are destitute, and not only economically destitute, but socially destitute. They are facing ostracisation from their communities and from larger society. And if we think about this from an efficacy perspective, this is the last thing we want to be doing, is marginalising, further marginalising already vulnerable women. We've also found, and what came through our research, was the problem of securitisation of services. So in our attempts to counter extremism or counter violent extremism, we are providing, and some states are providing a lot of money to these particular measures. But in so doing, they're securitising services that women would otherwise be seeking to, to avail themselves of. For example, English as a second language service. We have found, and there have been instances where these have been funded through countering violent extremism uh, uh, programs. And that has undermined trust with women in communities who fear if they are going to access those services which are essential for them to engage in society, their names are going to be taken, they're going to be collected, and they don't know where that information is going to be held, stored, collated, shared. It's also meant that essential services such as domestic violence services, women are feeling, we've heard on a number of occasions, less and less willing to avail themselves of domestic violence services because of the mistrust between the state and communities. And that is an essential thing that we all, I think every member state and anyone in this room can say that we don't want to be happening. Then fi finally, I think it's very important to think about gendered surveillance. Muslim women are the most visible in any Muslim community. And again and again, we heard from Muslim women how they have, they have had to alter their behaviour, what they say, who they speak to, where they go, their otherwise, otherwise signs of religiosity, how much they pray in public and other things, because they themselves carry the weight of the surveillance state because they are the very visible representations of Islam. And what we can see again and again in, in states is that that is also then not only reflected in societal perspectives, but it's also reflected in laws that ban wearing the hijab or other such things. And then finally, I've gone over time and I know that, is that uh, the representation of women is crucial when we are developing these policies. And not just the women that we want to hear from, but all Muslim women. Thank you very much. I thank Ms. Ahmed for her presentation. I would like to welcome Ms. Fionula Ni Olin. The Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms while Countering Terrorism. You have the floor. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm pleased that we have technology working again. And thank you for your patience. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to address you today. And I commence by underscoring the significance of holding an open briefing on gender integration into the work of the committee in UNCTES. And I commend the openness of the committee in addressing the role of women's civil society organizations in countering terrorism and violent extremism. When I was appointed Special Rapporteur in 2017, I identified a number of strategic priorities for the mandate. And one of them was supporting the role of civil society organizations in civic space in advancing human rights and rule of law based counterterrorism strategies and practice. Moreover, I wanted to highlight and bring attention to the protection and support required by civil society and, where necessary, 
to reveal the misuse or overreach of counterterrorism law and practice, specifically the negative effects that overreach would have on the collective goal I hope we all share of protecting and promoting human rights while countering terrorism. Civil society organizations, as many in the room know, are the heartbeat of communities around the globe. There is an old Irish phrase, er scáchéla a warren nanina, which literally means people live in each other's shadows. And I use it here to denote the intricate interdependence of successful counterterrorism efforts with meaningful, direct, and positive relationships with the peoples to whom that uh, policy and practice is directed and to have meaningful relationships with women's lived lives. An engaged, supported, independent, and robust civil society is absolutely critical to effective counterterrorism. Civil society organizations have been at the core, as many of us know, of supporting, enabling, and embedding conflict resolution, conflict transformation, and bringing an end to cycles of violence that have plagued many parts of the world. And that's a reality that I am positively and personally profoundly aware of, having lived much of my adult life in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Civil society plays an integral part in countering violent extremism, preventing extremism, as many of us have heard from Yasmin and others, and bringing the responses to terrorism into balance with broader human rights and international law obligations for states. Civil society gives voice to the most vulnerable, and I particularly want to highlight the role that civil society plays for victims of terrorism, whose experience are often challenged through civil society, and civil society organizations are often the sole conduit for providing a constructive route to accountability and transparency in counterterrorism. So let's perhaps focus on why we're all here specifically. Civil society is an essential cornerstone for engaging women and girls in civic life, in public discourse, and enabling the full capacities of women and girls to be realized around the globe. Empirically, many of us also know that women's engagement in public political life in many states has been historically limited, but women's engagement in civil society activism and in civic space has been sustained, vivid, and unfailing across the globe. Women's organizations and female actors are overrepresented statistically in civic space. And so when we talk about supporting civil society, particularly in conflicted and violent spaces, we are in fact talking about supporting women and their voices. And I would also underscore a point that many have made that where extremism and violence emerge, women are often the canary in the coal mine. They and their bodies are often the very first targets of violence and the first voices that are raised in civic space about the harm, the pathways, and the need for accountability. During and after violence, civil society and women human rights defenders are first in line, demanding accountability and calling us out when we fail to provide it. And civil society is the entity that has the essential capacity to resist violence, but also to tell us the uncomfortable things we do not want to hear about the causalities, complexities, and functionalities of violence. And so for all these reasons, we must collectively defend independent civil society. But let me share with you some of the mandate's concerns about our limitations and the negative effects of counterterrorism in this space and the absolute imperative for us to do better. Last March, I presented my annual report to the Human Rights Council and in it, I directed my attention to the use and misuse of counterterrorism and preventing violent extremism law and practice against civil society actors and civic space. I did so in the knowledge that since 2001, on a number of markers, civil society space around the globe is shrinking, which means that women's space is shrinking around the globe. We're also aware, many of us, that civil society is stigmatized, it faces substantive discrimination, and experiences a range of both substantive and procedural challenges. And again, I stress the obvious. When civil society experiences that, it is not mutual. It is gendered and experienced particularly by women. And the effects of this shrinkage and the effects of the harms that it invokes are gendered. 
So my report tried to move away from anecdotal stories, although those are really important about specific human rights defenders or particular civil society actors, and attempts to trace statistically what we are seeing globally. And so let me give you some examples of what the report found. The first and perhaps the most important finding is that since the inception of my mandate in 2005, 66% of all relevant communications sent by the mandate of the Special Rapporteur relating to the use of counterterrorism, preventing extremism, or countering violent extremism have uh, related to measures imposed on civil society. And for the last two years, that number is higher, 68%. This is an extraordinarily high figure, which underscores the misuse of counterterrorism measures against civil society and human rights actors over a decade and a half. And I stress again the very obvious point that given the gendered makeup of civic space, this finding has a gendered component. This means, in fact, that uh, women and girls are particularly negative effect uh, negatively affected when counterterrorism measures are used against civil society actors. But I also want to this is neither an effective, efficient, or smart use of human rights defenders who are predominantly female are not an effective target for uh, such measures. And and in statistics to our conversation, in part to sensitize us about the global pitfalls but also to deepen our collective knowledge about the work ahead, ahead. Most importantly, given this important step by the Counterterrorism Committee, focused on the value and importance of civil society to effective counterterrorism, hand in hand with the decision by CTED to integrate its work, there is an immediate and critical identification of this intersection between civil society work and the gender effect of terrorism. States every day, all of us know that we need civil society actors to address the causes and conditions conducive to extremism terrorism, as identified by the UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy and by the Strategy on Preventing and Countering Violent Extremism. What this really means in many countries is that we need female-led and female-constituted organizations to be our partners. Thoughtful states know that every day, resilience in a society to extremism will only be embedded through a robust and healthy civil society, and that that work is deeply gendered. It involves women and girls, and women and girls on the front lines of both counterterrorism, violent extremism, and, and extremism in general. I have seen and seen it in countries around the globe, the le leadership and passion of victims of terrorism organizations that I meet in, almost, in every country I visit. I see it in the women's rights groups that are advocating for women's full and equal participation in, in political life in countries that are beset by violence. And I see it in the women around the globe, women who are leading human rights organizations and are calling for accountability and justice because they fundamentally understand that without these things, we are in a Sisyphean fight, one that we are likely to lose against, counter, uh, against terrorism. Protecting and promoting independent civil society is one of the best inoculators for violence and extremism. Doing the opposite, namely targeting women's civil society organizations, is wholly inconsistent with meaningfully attending to the genuine terrorist threats that we are all so deeply aware of. Civil society is critical to channeling this discontent and allowing us to have that constructive and engaged space that we all need. And women's society, civil society organizations are at the forefront of these efforts. We need these organizations. And I hope that this open briefing gives us the inspiration and the determination to engage these organizations in a, and, and the women human rights defenders who lead them in a spirit of generosity, partnership, equality, and the recognition of our shared values and interests. I close with the words of the Canadian poet Rupi Kapoor to say that, and I quote, our work should equip the next generation of women to outdo us in every field, and this is the legacy that we will leave behind. Thank you all. Thank you also for your patience with the technical difficulties that we experienced. Muchas gracias.
Thank you very much, Ms. Nee Olin, for your presentation. I would like to thank both panelists for their contributions. This brings us to the end of our third session. I would now like to open the floor for any questions or comments. And I would invite you to make comments on the issues before us today. Would uh, I would offer the floor to members of the Security Council first. Would any member like to take the floor? I give the floor to the representative of Belgium. Thank you very much. Belgium would like to thank all of the panelists for their very interesting presentations that have had a lot of examples in them, a lot of recommendations. So thank you very much indeed. Integrating the gender dimension into the work of the committee and CTED is something that Belgium pays particular importance to. Belgium recognises that terrorism can have a different impact on men and on women, but also there can be a diff both of them can have a different impact on terrorism. We support the inclusion of gender aspects in combating terrorism. We welcome the mention of gender related challenges in the recent resolution uh, on the nexus between terrorism and uh, organized crime, and there are many other examples. Belgium integrates the specific nature of gender into its own policies to prevent radicalization that could lead to violence or to terrorism. And we also incorporate this into our reintegration policies. Since 2009, pursuant to Resolution 1325 of the Security Council, Belgium has laid out these objectives in a national plan. Women, Peace and Security, the third version of this national action plan, has into ALIA the objective of taking into consideration the gender dimension as part of counter-terrorism and as part of preventing radicalization. Belgium would like to thank UN uh, OCT for its work, and CTED rather, for integrating gender into its work, and we would encourage CTED to continue this work along these lines as well as member states. Thank you very much indeed. I thank the representative of Belgium. I now give the floor to the representative of the United States. Thank you to CTED for hosting this briefing, and thank you to the chair as well. Um, fighting terrorism requires addressing specific factors that drive radicalization in communities. Poor governance, including human rights abuses by security sector actors, and marginalization. Including women in these efforts and addressing gender inequality that helps fuel violent extremism is essential to successful CVE policies. The U.S. strategy on women, peace, and security and the U.S. strategy to support women and girls at risk of violent extremism and conflict chart a course for the United States government to undertake gender analysis in our overseas programs related to conflict resolution, management, and countering violent extremism. Gender analysis accounts for the fact that women and girls' perceptions of security and participation in or how they're affected from violence may be different than those of men and boys in the community. Strong analytical tools help us define risk and opportunities in order to maintain international attention on the various ways women and girls are affected by extremism and extremist violence as supporters of terrorism, victims of its violence, and partners in preventing it. It is important that we continue to assess the international community's response to the role of both women and men in countering and preventing violent extremism, and to examine how we can include women's leadership in organizations, including the civil society organizations mentioned by the Special Rapporteur, in response to, the, to respond to these efforts more effectively and consistently. We must work cooperatively to assist member states in developing the appropriate tools, including through prevention, interdiction, prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration of foreign terrorist fighters. Special considerations need to be made for the unique trauma and needs of female foreign terrorist fighters. <laughs> 
The United States is taking steps to address this important issue on several fronts, including through the congressionally mandated strategy on women and girls at risk of violent extremism and conflict. This strategy calls for the application of gender analysis in our countering violent extremism initiatives, which has identified opportunities to provide more than 30 million in programming over the last two years to support lines of effort identified in this strategy. Investments in countering violent extremism research is also critical. The United States supports and conducts its own research and analysis on the role of women in promoting and countering violent extremism. Our support includes collecting on-the-ground data, such as through the CVE Baseline Program, which has found that community support for women's empowerment is correlated with resilience to violent extremism. U.S. efforts to this end include work to building networks of women leaders to counter this violent activity. Within families, we are supporting parents, including mothers, to identify early warning signs of radicalization. The United States will continue to promote efforts to partner with credible community-based organizations with access to the women and girls most vulnerable to this phenomenon. We look forward to working with our partners on this effort and are pleased to see today a number of civil society organizations in the audience. We hope that this will be the case for other uh, CTC briefings as well. I had one question for the panelists today. I was very interested in the discussion on repatriation of uh, female foreign terrorist fighters covered by Mr. David Wells of CTED and the ICRC. And we would be interested to hear any trends and lessons learned that have been examined. Uh, we also noticed that we commend some of our partners in the room today from the Central Asian region for repatriating their citizens. And we also see that in there in the room today as well. And so we would be very interested to hear some of the lessons learned uh, that CTED and ICRC have found. Thank you so much. I thank the representative of the United States and I now give the floor to the representative of Germany. Thank you, Chair. And thanks to the panelists for the very interesting briefings today, and thanks to CTED for convening this important meeting. Um, violent misogyny is at the very center of many terrorist strategies and ideologies, with the women activists, women human rights defenders and peace builders, as well as women politicians often being the first to be targeted by a terrorist regime. When we look at the plight that women have endured under the terrorist regime of ISIS in Syria and Iraq, this debate could hardly be more timely. While state-like structures of the so-called caliphate have been dismantled, ISIS is not defeated. The threat of terrorism is still very relevant and immediate. Germany has a holistic human rights-based approach that also addresses the root causes of violent extremism. Strengthening women's rights is as important as ensuring rule of law, accountability, as well as civil society empowerment. We strive to look at and actively address gender-specific is issues in a wide variety of policy areas and UN activities and mandates. For example, Germany introduced Security Council Resolution 2467 to advance women's rights in conflict situations, including conflicts related to terrorism. We reinforced this concept in Security Council Resolution 2482. As we have heard several times today, women's roles in violent extremism are diverse. From ISIS, we know that women played a decisive, decisive and active role for the cohesion in recruitment and as perpetrators of war crimes. At the same time, it is often women who can most effectively contribute to prevention and women who are trusted as peace builders. Therefore, gender sensitivity is critical to a comprehensive conflict and threat analysis. And therefore, we applaud CTED's important work. Solid policy-oriented research, as provided by CTED, is a key component for coming up with appropriate policy solutions. And we're looking forward to receive more valuable impact, uh, input from CTED. Education and public information are necessary parts of any solution. Developing counter-narratives on the internet and social media is very important. But let's not forget that the direct contact within a community within a group of friends, within schools, places of worship, community center, or other public spaces, need to be even more prominent and promising. Intensifying human connections might stop people from isolating themselves and drifting into a world of radical ideas, distorted belief, and false hope, making them vulnerable to so-called offers from terrorist groups, as were described, especially in the second panel today. It is essential to reach out to women and men alike. 
equally important, we need to include both women and men as drivers of peaceful change in our prevention strategies. Another priority for Germany is criminal prosecution of crimes committed by Daesh, and therefore I was very, really, really closely um, and interested listening to what um, Ms. Ahmed just said in the last panel about the prosecution and um, sentence against women. In Germany, the Federal Public Prosecutor General has started numerous investigations against IS supporters who have returned to Germany, including women. They are charged for membership in a terrorist organization, war crimes, and violation of the rules concerning war weapons control. One of the alleged offenders is accused of murdering a UCD child. On 5th of July this year, the first verdict was passed against a woman who was running propaganda for the IS on her blog, and she was sentenced to five years imprisonment. Briefly touching on the, on the issue of repatriation, almost two-thirds of German citizens who are detained in northern Syria at the moment are women. We strive for an orderly return with emphasis on humanitarian aspects. We prioritize repatriating children, who we predominantly consider victims, and those women who are not subject of criminal investigations. I'd like to end by once more thanking CTED as well as the other panelists, briefers, and their organizations for their very important work um, providing the basis uh, for developing joint, comprehensive, and gender-sensitive policy responses um, to tackle the root causes of radicalization, violent extremism, and terrorism. Thank you. I thank the representative of Germany, and I now give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, CTED. Um, we're very pleased especially to have this open briefing on the first day of our presidency. As a co-pen holder on 2242, we believe that the integration of gender into all aspects of counterterrorism and CVE is in fact a key component of its credibility and its effectiveness. And I think to, to that end, we'd very much also like to welcome UN Women, UNODC, other UN partners, and certainly our civil society colleagues uh, in the room today. It certainly um, was a little disheartening, but I think not inaccurate when we heard that quite often terrorists have been out front of many of us in integrating gender into their approach, and so it does seem like high time that we, uh, we catch up and close that gap. I very briefly want to make three points, which include a couple of questions. We heard a lot today, so I'll try and consolidate it. Um, we've heard, and I think it was particularly welcome, about many different nuances in the roles and radicalization dynamics of women across ISIL and Daesh. And I think it was uh, Leanne Erdberg who also mentioned extreme right-wing groups. I think it's very important for us to keep in mind as the terrorist threat evolves that we also need to ask some of these same questions about women's roles in extreme right-wing, extreme left-wing, single-use terrorist groups. And remember all that time, um, in all that time, that these aren't in fact new. We have a lot of lessons to learn from past experiences um, with women and terrorism. So certainly to take that into account as we develop a deeper understanding of gender dynamics. Um, the second point I wanted to touch on is the UK is looking at vulnerability and culpability with a very balanced perspective regardless of gender. However, we do also recognize that this balance is sometimes difficult where there are inequalities and circumstances that shape women's participation or opportunities, um, especially where they are perhaps coerced or pressured to join. And so welcome lessons learned and discussions about how to balance um, you know, this approach between um, looking at women's roles and culpability in prosecution, rehabilitation, reintegration, regardless of gender, while balancing, um, while balancing some of the inequalities. Um, certainly in the UK, we have tried to integrate gender in terms of both research and operational training and support. Uh, we have supported research and a deepening of the understanding of gender dynamics across a number of um, our own internal agencies and through other, um, other partners. But we're also looking at some of our capacity building um, and internal training efforts to look at making sure that women are part of the um, part of the analysis process, but also in terms of recruitment and in terms of access to projects. And I think that's something we can all look at improving uh, in a number of aspects. To that end, we do have, um, we've published a cross-departmental guidance note to ensure that all departments that are engaged in counterterrorism efforts have access to a lot of the same guidance um, and priorities and information. And we're working very closely with partners, including civil society and a number of implementing partners.
Um, the National Action Plan, the 1325 National Action Plan, also has a very important CVE strategic objective, which is to ensure and enhance women's increased participation in the delivery um, of CTCVE projects. Um, I also just wanted to make one comment. Uh, we heard today about a number of really useful UN products and tools and handbooks and guidance note. Um, it would be very helpful, I think, from an absorption point of view if these could be rationalized and collated going forward or if there was some way to make sure that the different products that are coming out speak to each other or, in, or are in somehow made more accessible to member states in terms of uh, one or fewer products, if that is possible. Thank you. I thank the representative of the United Kingdom. I thank the Security Council members who have taken the floor on this item, and I now open the floor to all other participants and guests. Doy la palabra. I give the floor to the representative of Sri Lanka. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Sri Lanka thanks the CDC and CTED uh, for hosting this open briefing and the panelists for their comprehensive and um, interesting presentations. Um, Sri Lanka is committed uh, to integrating gender into its national policies um, and frameworks, including implementing uh, related resolutions. Having suffered under the yoke of terrorism for nearly 30 years, Sri Lanka understands the differential impact of conflict on men and women uh, and youth. Um, Sri Lanka, um, and as already extensively discussed, um, extremism and radicalization can stem from uh, various political, socioeconomic, and psychological factors, and therefore addressing the root causes um, and also addressing SGBV issues are very important. Uh, therefore, one of the key target groups in Sri Lanka's empowerment programs are female-headed households, uh, including war widows, um, uh, Sri Lanka knows or recognizes the fact that the protection and economic, social, and infrastructural needs of war-affected women continue to require our attention. To this end, uh, Sri Lanka finds it crucial to incorporate gender in transitional justice uh, processes as stipulated in Resolution 1325. Um, Sri Lanka is, in this regard, also currently in the process of developing uh, an action plan on women, peace, and security for the implementation of Resolution 1325 with the support of the government of Japan. However, although a separate comprehensive action plan uh, devoted to the WPS agenda is still under development. The issues addressed in 1325 are incorporated in several other specific action plans, such as for the protection and promotion of human rights, plan of action to address sexual and gender-based violence, and the action plan for women-headed households. A whole-of-government plan of action to prevent and counter violent extremism and build community resilience throughout the country is also being explored at this time, which, uh, which will also integrate gender. Um, Sri Lanka recognizes the need to address gender mainstreaming in post-conflict reconciliation. And in this regard, we, uh, Sri Lanka continues to engage the PBF uh, through the Peace Building Priority Plan. Uh, the scope of the plan was expanded in 2018 to include 12 new strategic outputs um, where gender is incorporated. The peace building recovery facility, uh, facility projects also include the participation of youth and women in the peace building process through engagement in policy making processes to improve the role of women in politics. Uh, gender and youth promotion initiatives also include empowering women um, for inclusive and sustainable peace and reconciliation and building peace through economic empowerment of women in Sri Lanka. Uh, again, I thank you for inviting us to this briefing and for uh, hosting this very, very important um, uh, 
briefing on this important subject. Thank you very much. I thank the representative of Sri Lanka, and I now give the floor to the representative of Kazakhstan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to present some of the best practices and lessons learned by Kazakhstan as a member state. Uh, preventing and combating international terrorism has been uh, Kazakhstan's priority since its independence, and particularly during our uh, non-permanent membership to the Security Council in 2017-2018. Our, our efforts are relentless even today. My, my delegation is of a firm conviction that the fight against international terrorism demands a long-term comprehensive approach and cooperation at all levels, with the active participation of all member states, global and regional structures and civil societies in which women play an important role as indispensable and invaluable partners. Kazakhstan has responded to the growing threat of terrorism in a significant way by initiating a non-binding political declaration entitled the Code of Conduct towards achieving the world free of terrorism in September 2018 at the margins of uh, 73rd session of uh, the General Assembly. I'm happy uh, to inform that uh, as of today, 86 member states have joined the code, and we thank them for sincerely uh, for, coming towards, uh, for, uh, for coming forwards to coalesce together to support the UN in implementing um, GCTS and encourage others to join this uh, coalition. Kazakhstan is currently actively engaged uh, in the joint plan of action for implementing a uh, UN global uh, counterterrorism strategy in Central Asia by not just addressing but also implementing all four pillars of the strategy, women contributing to it significantly. The third phase of this uh, GPOA is successfully launched in, uh, with the support of UN Regional Center for Preventive Diplomacy in Central Asia. UN Office for uh, Counterterrorism and Counterterrorism Committee Executive Directorate in May 2018 in Ashgabat. Kazakhstan is proud to be one of the uh, to be the first donor to the third phase of the joint plan of action. Our efforts are very much uh, focused on protecting women and preventing gender recruitment and engaging women in fight uh, in fighting violence extremism. Um, uh, CTED experts visited uh, Astana in May 2016, and their recommendations for uh, reinforcing further national counterterrorism measures are currently being implemented. In March 2018, Kazakhstan adopted the state program for countering religious extremism and terrorism for the period 2018-2022, which is fully aligned with the UN GCTS. Additionally, Kazakhstan will more than uh, quadruple its budget to 837 million in the next five years for this purpose. The focus is not only to eliminate religious extremism and terrorism, but to introduce security sector reforms together with improved legislative and, and organizational frame, framework for identifying and combating religious extremism and terrorism. As part of our efforts to uh, counter uh, radicalism, extremism and hate, Kazakhstan initiated and has successfully convened six congresses of leaders of all and traditional religions, together with political leaders and other organizations in the capital of Kazakhstan, in which we have a significant participation of high-level women leaders who have great impact on their communities. Our counterterrorism work will be reinforced as we incorporate the women peace and security agenda and provide for the empowerment of women at all levels and at all levels, from, uh, from echelons of power to grassroots. Uh, thus, implementing uh, resolutions uh, 1325 means to prevent and resolve conflicts and in turn also counter terrorism and violent extremism. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would also like to share with, uh, with this distinguished uh, gathering uh, Kazakhstan's unique experience of successfully bringing home um, from Syria, a total of 595 uh, Kazakh citizens, including over 400 children, who were previously involved in the uh, ISIL. This undertaking uh, is an innovative operation called Jusan, uh, 
possible only because of very close international cooperation executed in four phases uh, from January to June 2019. Translated from the Kazakh language, the name Josan means bitter warm wood, which for nomad, nomads is associated with the uh, fragrance of the homeland. This underlines the humanitarian character of the entire rescue operation, uh, primarily for women and children who became the victim of terrorism. Um, uh, those returning uh, home uh, undergo a rehabilitation program and a reintegration back into society, and we have already seen positive results. Several women from the first batch have secured jobs and are currently working. Children are joined uh, with their relatives and go to public schools. It is, still, it is still a work in progress, but is beginning to bear the fruits. Many of these women are our partners in, uh, in assisting in the awareness raising efforts uh, to prevent further recruitment. With the participation of government agencies, non-governmental organizations, clergy and volunteers, measures were taken uh, in the spheres of medical, psychological and social assistance. Their re rehabilitation continues uh, at specially uh, created regional centers, which integrate lawyers, uh, theologians, uh, teachers, and ex experts in the field of child, women, and religious uh, psychology. Today, Kazakhstan is one of the few countries in the world that carries out such humanitarian actions and ready to share its experience. In conclusion, uh, I would like to read out the statement by 25-year-old Aida Sarina, um, who, uh, one of the uh, uh, women who uh, returned from Syria. In her statement, um, Aida declares, yes, I am a victim of terrorism, but now I want to become a fighter against terrorism, be a part of this great purpose and make my contribution. I want to be the voice of all women who suffered terrorism. Thank you for your attention. I thank the representative of Kazakhstan. I now give the floor to the permanent representative of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much. Uh, I wish to thank the panelists and CDET for the comprehensive briefing as a means to further the dialogue in the international community on gender as a cross-cutting issue in counterterrorism and preventing violent extremism efforts. I wish to reiterate that the international terrorism continues to threaten the United Nations shared values of peace, tolerance, and respect for human dignity, and therefore a global response to the scourge of violent extremism remains important. I wish to take note that the Security Council has adopted a number of resolutions calling for member states to adopt a gender-sensitive approach to specific issues related to prosecution rehabilitation and reintegration, which confirms the effective counterterrorism and PV measures must address the socioeconomic challenges and pressures attendant in vulnerable societies, which further fertile ground for exploitation by terrorist groups in order to breed hatred, intolerance, and violence. I wish to emphasize that marginalized groups, in particular women and girls, are disproportionately affected by violent conflict and are targets of extremist violence and terrorist acts, including human trafficking. At the same time, women can also actively support terrorist groups through the recruitment of others, spreading of extremist ideologies and participating in violent acts. I wish to stress, therefore, that understanding the complex relationships between women, gender, and violent extremism is critical to counterterrorism efforts and to express support for ensuring that international, regional, sub-regional, and national efforts take into account gender dimensions that reflect women's needs, agency, and leadership. Trinidad and Tobago remains deeply concerned by the number of Trinidad and Tobago nationals that travel to areas of conflicts as foreign terrorist fighters, and also recognize that their return also poses a challenge that requires a cohesive response. I wish to indicate that the government of Trinidad and Tobago has amended several key pieces of legislation to prevent and counter acts of terrorism and its, and its financing, including most recently significant amendments to the Anti-Terrorism Act in August 2018, 
which address technical deficiencies in terms of compliance with Security Council Resolutions 1267 and 1373 on foreign terrorist fighters. I wish to further indicate that Trinidad and Tobago has placed significant focus on understanding and addressing radicalization at the national level, identifying the drivers for at-risk populations, in particular women and youth, and assisting with rehabilitation of the FTFs who return to Trinidad and Tobago from conflict territories. I wish to express appreciation for the support provided by the United Nations Office on Counterterrorism in the area of preventing violent extremism, including the hosting of a workshop in Trinidad on strategic communication on PVE. I wish to call for further support for member states to ensure more effective and systematic collection of gender disaggregated data in the context of foreign terrorist fighters, which would allow for a better understanding of the scope of the phenomena, facilitate more comparative research, and thus contribute to more effective responses, such as a tailored prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration strategies, risk assessment tools, counter narratives, and PVE programs. And finally, uh, just to indicate that Trinidad and Tobago will host the joint CARICOM UNCCT high level conference on countering terrorism and preventing violent extremism and indicate as a host Trinidad and Tobago will be interested in incorporating this perspective in our deliberations in Port of Spain next year. And finally, again, just the last one, to recognize that the United Nations as an integral partner in ensuring international peace and security and reaffirm Trinidad and Tobago's commitment to combating international terrorism and violent extremism. Thank you. I thank the permanent representative of Trinidad and Tobago. I now call on Australia. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to all the speakers today. Australia commends the United Nations Security Council Counterterrorism Committee for holding this open briefing today. It has been a very valuable briefing on how we can better incorporate a gender-sensitive approach into our counterterrorism measures. United Nations Security Council resolutions have rightly emphasised the need for gender-sensitive approaches to prevent and counter violent extremism. They have also called for greater participation and leadership of women and to amplify the work of women and women's civil society organisations. Terrorists have cleverly exploited gender norms and stereotypes. We need to be smarter on gender than they are to counter violent extremism effectively. This is a matter of practical counter-terrorism effectiveness. Terrorist organisations, including groups with very diverse ideological motivations, demonstrate a nuanced understanding of gender norms and stereotypes. They seek to tap into different vulnerabilities among men and women in different local contexts as a means to attract, recruit and maintain followers. Strategies to prevent and counter violent extremism are more effective when they recognise the influence of gender norms as well as the diverse roles women play, for example in recruitment or as active participants. And just as women can mobilise others to violent extremism, they too can help deter and disengage their communities from violent extremism. They are at the front line in many initiatives to prevent and counter terrorism. Women are key actors in countering and preventing violent extremism in their families, communities, in law enforcement, intelligence agencies and national authorities. In contributing to international efforts, Australia co-chairs the Countering Violent Extremism Working Group of the Global Counterterrorism Forum with our close friend and partner, Indonesia. This represents just one of the many examples of Australia and Indonesia's close partnership in combating terrorism and violent extremism. Through this work, we are focusing on the issue of gender and countering violent extremism in collaboration with UN entities, other member states and civil society partners. Australia welcomed the Global Counterterrorism Forum's endorsement of an addendum to the Good Practices on Women and CVE in September 29, which was produced by the CVE Working Group. Australia remains committed to working with the Counterterrorism Committee, UNCTED, other UN entities, 
member states civil and civil society partners to integrate gender throughout our counter-terrorism activities. Thank you very much. I thank the representative of Australia and I give the floor to the representative of Canada. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and many thanks to the CTC and CTED for hosting this important briefing today. I think it's been very valuable as we wind down WPS week to have the opportunity to exchange our views on these issues. And I'd also like to thank you for the balance that you created in the panels. Um, I think it was a really great mix of UN agencies, of civil society, of men and women uh, that allowed us to reflect on some of the themes that were being discussed and really reinforced how important it is to integrate gender into our CT efforts. I'd like to begin with the comments from USIP on the fact that terrorist groups bring value by being able to see women. So what, what do we need to do? As practitioners, we largely continue to rely on simplified gender stereotypes, assumptions and biases that cast women as victims and men as perpetrators, which along with other problematic assumptions dominate the CVE and CT narrative. This has important consequences and prevents some of us from grasping the more complex, nuanced, and yet critical dimensions of violent extremism and terrorism. This paradigm is changing, but slowly. Canada has been trying to speed up the pace of change by championing, championing this issue and highlighting the importance of gender considerations and the WPS agenda in counterterrorism policies and programs in our bilateral and multilateral efforts. For example, Canada integrates gender and WPS into CT efforts through the Counterterrorism Capacity Building Program, which provides over 25 million in CVE programming globally, with the goal of reducing recruitment and strengthening community resilience against radicalization to violence. Um, I'd like to conclude with a few reflections on some of the work ahead of us. We must develop a more sophisticated gender perspective that is not limited to women, but also considers the roles of men, both in relation to the radicalization to violence, as well as to the disengagement, rehabilitation, and reintegration programs. Men and women experience and respond to armed conflict, violent extremism, and terrorism differently. We must therefore ensure that women are consulted and included in the development, implementation, and evaluation of PVE, CVE, and CT efforts. This will help to replace the add women and mix model with a more nuanced approach that addresses the exploitation of masculinities and femininities for radicalization to violence. And finally, in engaging women, we must be careful not to scrutinize and instrumentalize them because this will only undermine their effectiveness in grassroots efforts and put them in harm's way. And I'll just end by noting um, the significance I'm also taking from the fact that I believe all of the member states um, that have spoken so far have been women representatives. And I, I thank all my member states colleagues for bringing this voice to the table. Thank you. I thank the representative of Canada. And I now give the floor to the representative of Ireland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to thank all of the panelists and the CTED for an extremely interesting and timely event at the end of what has been a very busy WPS week. It is Ireland's view, and certainly it is also one of the main takeaways from today's discussion, that it is important not to see the objective of integrating gender into our counterterrorism work as purely a security issue. Two out of the three sessions this afternoon have focused on dealing with women as perpetrators or as potential perpetrators of terrorism. And while the security aspects of the question are, of course, increasingly relevant, as we have seen with the phenomenon of women recruits to ISIS, this is not the only lens. For Ireland, it is crucial to also address this issue from a human rights and gender equality perspective, focusing on the participation and agency of women in counterterrorism approaches. We can all acknowledge that the field of counterterrorism has been exceptionally male-dominated. It is also a field which, as highlighted by, the, by Special Rapporteur Nia Elon in her recent report to the Human Rights Council, has been quite resistant to engagement with civil society, including women's civil society organisations, in the development and implementation of counterterrorism policy. This has been to the great detriment of the effectiveness of international terrorism approaches. Counterterrorism measures which do not make space for civil society or integrate human rights and gender equality cannot in the long run be considered effective counterterrorism and government measures which lack these crucial elements can in fact contribute to radicalization.
we need to recognize that counterterrorism measures have in many instances been instrumentalized by governments to stifle civil society space. And as the panelists have pointed out, women's organizations and women's hum women human rights defenders are particularly vulnerable to the effects of shrinking civil society space. I want to echo Ms. Ahmed's emphasis that it is important not to securitize this, um, this issue. Gender has to be considered more broadly by the counterterrorism community. And again, I'd just like to thank you for this very, very interesting event and um, to the end of this week and congratulate the panel on a great, great contributions. I thank the representative of Ireland and all of the other participants. And now I open the floor to our panelists and our guests to respond to the questions raised or to make any additional comments if they so wish. Yeah, unfortunately, it looks like our, our colleagues from ICRC have left. So um, just to respond to the question from the United States representative, uh, it's, not, it's not often you get asked a question in a meeting like this and you have a, a publication ready to go in front of all of the uh, attendees to answer the question. Um, so I won't repeat what the uh, analytical briefs say, but I, what I would just emphasize a couple of the key points. I think we were very keen uh, when approaching this issue that we did two separate publications. We know uh, how often women and children can be grouped together. Uh, and I think what was very clear from doing that on the analytical side was that by separating them out, it was very clear how low the rates of uh, repatriation for women have been. Uh, so I think that's one, one key takeaway. I think um, that said, having separate publications, they do, do need to be read together because I think part of the reason for that very low rate is the reluctance by member states to separate family units um, and partly driven by um, legal requirements and legal challenges. So I think um, as a result of that, states have prioritized the repatriation, or, or many states at least have prioritized the repatriation of unaccompanied uh, children and orphans um, rather than dealing with uh, women who are there with their children. Um, looking ahead, I think ICRC provided an excellent brief on the current, current state of affairs, um, so I, I won't touch on that, but I think one thing to emphasize in light of the discussions we've had today is that, of course, as we've heard from uh, the representative of Kazakhstan, the repatriation process is, of course, just the first step. It's, a, it's an urgently needed step in terms of the humanitarian uh, situation in the camps, but of course, it has to be followed by a, a comprehensive and tailored PRR approach on, on the uh, return to the state of origin. Thank you very much, Mr. Wells. Does any other panelist wish to take the floor? If that is not the case, then I'd like to thank everyone for their participation. We have reached the end of our open briefing, and I believe that we've heard very informative presentations and we've had a useful opportunity for an exchange of views. And I will conclude by making the following closing statement. Excellencies, distinguished representatives, ladies and gentlemen, during our discussions today, we focused on three thematic priorities, the drivers of female radicalization, gender-sensitive prosecution, rehabilitation and reintegration strategies, and the role of women's civil society organizations in countering terrorism and violent extremism. We have learned about the many push and pull factors of women's radicalization, the role that women play in violent extremist groups in different regional contexts, and the skillful ways in which terrorist groups use and exploit gender dynamics. Understanding the diverse circumstances and motivations behind women's radicalization is essential to design effective, tailored measures to counter and prevent their involvement in violent extremism. The one-size-fits-all policies will not be sufficient. We have also discussed the challenges and the good practices associated with ensuring return from terrorist groups in a gender-sensitive manner and in compliance with international law, including international humanitarian law, international human rights law, and refugee law. The current situation of women and children held in northern Syria and Iraq uh, 
requires an urgent response. We must strengthen our efforts to develop more effective and nuanced gender-sensitive solutions to screening, prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration using tailored risk assessment tools. In our responses, we must be mindful of the different roles played by women, bearing in mind that there is no simple binary relationship between victim and perpetrator, and that women engage in and are affected by violence in complex ways. It is also essential to ensure that those efforts are effective and human rights compliant. In particular, we must be aware of the impacts of counterterrorism measures on women's rights. This is an area that requires further research and analysis to inform our policy and programming responses. We have also discussed the importance of empowering women as well as other concerned civil society groups in countering violent extremism, ensuring the leadership and participation of women in countering violent extremism is essential in addressing radicalization at the community level. We must strengthen our efforts to involve women in decision-making and in the design and implementation of CVE policies and programs at all levels in order to ensure that women are agents and leaders and rather than just subjects in this struggle. While much work remains to be done, the Counterterrorism Committee and its Executive Directorate will continue to work closely with their partners, including civil society and academia, to assist member states to identify gaps and good practices in these areas and to incorporate gender as a cross-cutting issue into all their counterterrorism activities. Thank you all for your contributions today. I would also like to thank the interpreters, the sound engineer, and the secretariat for their assistance. Today's briefing is adjourned. Well, thank you very much.